Hello everyone, welcome back to our classic tale story time. I am Miss Libba, your narrator, and we are reading L.M. Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables. Now we are well into the book at this point, so if you are just joining us, you can go back, uh, if you look at our Facebook videos tab or our YouTube channel, you can start at uh, part one. We are at chapter 30 today. So in the last reading, uh, Anne got to go to a really wonderful exhibition where um, folks had their, their plants and their prize pigs and all sorts of wonderful things to see. But Anne came back home, I think, being more appreciative of home. And in the past few chapters, we really have seen Anne grow into a young woman. I, th I believe she is um, 13 at this point. So. She is, she is now a young teenager, and her relationship with the folks in Avonlea has grown. She's really become a part of the community, a part of uh, Marilla and Matthew Cuthbert's family. And um, I've really enjoyed seeing how those relationships have blossomed. So let's move on to chapter 30. This chapter is titled, The Queen's Class is Organized. So I'm just gonna check my audio real quick. All right, sounds like we are good. The Queen's class is organized. Marilla laid her knitting on her lap and leaned back in her chair. Her eyes were tired and she thought vaguely that she must see about having her glasses changed the next time she went to town, for her eyes had grown tired very often of late. It was nearly dark, for the dull November twilight had fallen around Green Gables, and the only light in the kitchen came from the dancing red flames of the stove. Anne was curled up Turk fashion on the hearth rug, gazing into that joyous glow where the sunshine of a hundred summers was being distilled from the maple cord wood. She had been reading, but her book had slipped to the floor, and now she was dreaming, with a smile on her parted lips. Glittering castles in Spain were shaping themselves out of the mists and rainbows of her lively fancy. Adventures wonderful and enthralling were happening to her in Cloudland adventures that always turned out triumphantly and never involved her in scrapes like those of actual life. Marilla looked at her with a tenderness that would never have been suffered to reveal itself in any clearer light than, the most, than that soft mingling of fire, shine, and shadow. 
The lesson of a love that should display itself easily in spoken word and open look was one Marilla could never learn. But she had learned to love the slim, gray-eyed girl with an affection all the deeper and stronger from its very undemonstrativeness. Her love made her afraid of being unduly indulgent indeed. She had an uneasy feeling that it was rather sinful to set one's heart so intensely on any human creature as she had set hers on Anne. And perhaps she performed a sort of unconscious penance for this by being stricter and more critical than if the girl had been less dear to her. Certainly Anne herself had no idea how Marilla loved her. She sometimes thought wistfully that Marilla was very hard to please and distinctly lacking in sympathy and understanding, but she always checked the thought reproachfully, remembering that she, what she owed to Marilla. Anne, said Marilla abruptly, Miss Stacy was here this afternoon when you were out with Diana. Anne came back from her other world with a start and a sigh. Oh, was she? Oh, I'm so sorry I wasn't in. Why didn't you call me, Marilla? Diana and I were only over in the haunted wood. It's lovely in the woods now. All the little wood things, the ferns and the satin leaves and the cracker berries have gone to sleep, just as if somebody had tucked them away until spring under a blanket of leaves. I think it was a little gray fairy with a rainbow scarf that came tiptoeing along the last moonlight night and did it. Diana wouldn't say much about that, though. Diana has never forgotten the scolding her mother gave her about imagining ghosts into the haunted wood. It had a very bad effect on Diana's imagination. It blighted it. Mrs. Lynde says Myrtle Bell is a blighted being. I asked Ruby Gillis why Myrtle was blighted, and Ruby said she guessed it was because her young man had gone back on her. Ruby Gillis thinks of nothing but young men, and the older she gets, the worse she is. Young men are all very well in their place, but it doesn't do to drag them into everything, does it? Diana and I are thinking seriously of promising each other that we will never marry, but be nice old maids and live together forever. Diana hasn't quite made up her mind, though, because she thinks perhaps it would be nobler to marry some wild, dashing, wicked young man and reform him. Diana and I talk a great deal about serious subjects now, you know. We feel that we are so much older than we used to be that it isn't becoming to talk of childish matters. It's such a solemn thing to be almost 14, Marilla. Miss Stacy took all us girls who are in our teens down to the brook last Wednesday and talked to us about it. She said we couldn't be too careful what habits we formed and what ideals we acquired in our teens because by the time we were 20, our characters would be developed and the foundation laid our whole future life. And she said if the foundation was shaky, we could never build anything really worthwhile on it. Diana and I talked the matter over coming home from school. We felt extremely solemn, Marilla, and we decided that we would try to be very careful indeed and form respectable habits and learn all we could and be as sensible as possible so that by the time we were 20, our characters would be properly developed. It's perfectly appalling to think of being 20, Marilla. It sounds so fearfully old and grown up. But why was Miss Stacy here this afternoon? That is what I want to tell you, Anne, if you'll ever give me a chance to get a word in edgewise. She was talking about you. About me? Anne looked rather scared. Then she flushed and exclaimed, Oh, I know what she was saying. I meant to tell you, Marilla. Honestly, I did, but I forgot. Miss Stacy caught me reading Ben-Hur in school yesterday afternoon when I should have been studying my Canadian history. Jane Andrews lent it to me. I was reading it at dinner hour, and I had just got to the chariot race when school went in. I was simply wild to know how it turned out, although I felt sure Ben-Hur must win because it wouldn't be very poetical justice if he didn't. So I spread the history open on my desk lid and then tucked Ben-Hur between the desk and my knee. It just looked as if I was studying Canadian history, you know, while all the while I was reveling in Ben-Hur. I was so interested in it that I never noticed Miss Stacy coming down the aisle until all at once I just looked up and there she was looking down at me, so reproachful-like. I can't tell you how ashamed I felt, Marilla, especially when I heard Josie Pye giggling. Miss Stacy took Ben-Hur away, but she never said a word then. She kept me in at recess and talked to me. She said I had done very wrong in two respects. First, I was wasting the time I ought to have put on my studies, and secondly, I was deceiving my teacher in trying to make it appear I was reading a history when it was a storybook instead. 
I had never realized until that moment, Marilla, that what I was doing was deceitful. I was shocked. I, I cried bitterly and asked Miss Stacy to forgive me and I'd never do such a thing again. And I offered to do penance by never so much as looking at Ben-Hur for a whole week, not even to see how the chariot race turned out. But Miss Stacy said she wouldn't require that and she forgave me freely. So I, I think it wasn't very kind of her to come up here to tell you about it after all. Miss Stacy never mentioned such a thing to me, Anne, and it's only your guilty conscience that's the matter with you. You have no business to be taking storybooks to school. You read too many novels anyhow. When I was a girl, I wasn't so much as allowed to look at a novel. Oh, how can you call Ben-Hur a novel when it's really such a religious book, protested Anne. Of course, it's a little too exciting to be a proper reading for Sunday, and I only read it on weekdays, and I never read any book now unless either Miss Stacy or Mrs. Allen thinks it is a proper book for a girl thirteen and three quarters to read. Miss Stacy made me promise that. She found me reading a book one day called The Lurid Mystery of the Haunted Hall. It was one Ruby Gillis had lent me, and oh, Marilla, it was so fascinating and creepy. It just curdled the blood in my veins. But Miss Stacy said it was a very silly, unwholesome book, and she asked me not to read any more of it or any like it. I didn't mind promising not to read any more like it, but it was agonizing to give back that book without knowing how it turned out. But my love for Miss Stacy stood the test, and I did. It's really wonderful, Marilla, what you can do when you're truly anxious to please a certain person. Well, I guess I'll light the lamp and get to work, said Marilla. I see plainly that you don't want to hear what Miss Stacy had to say. You're more interested in the sound of your own tongue than in anything else. Oh, indeed, Marilla, I do want to hear it, cried Anne contritely. I won't say another word, not one. I know I talk too much, but I am really trying to overcome it, and though, although I say far too much, yet if you only knew how many things I want to say and don't, you'd give me some credit for it. Please tell me, Marilla. Well, Miss Stacy wants to organize a class among her advanced students who mean to study for the entrance examination into Queens. She intends to give them extra lessons for an hour after school, and she came to ask Matthew and me if we would like to have you join it. What do you think about it yourself, Anne? Would you like to go to Queens and pass for a teacher? Oh, Marilla! Anne straightened to her knees and clasped her hands. It's been the dream of my life, that is, for the last six months, ever since Ruby and Jane began to talk of studying for their entrance. But I didn't say anything about it because I supposed it would be perfectly useless. I'd love to be a teacher, but won't it be dreadfully expensive? Mr. Andrews says it cost him $150 to put Prissy through, and Prissy wasn't a dunce in geometry. I guess you needn't worry about that part of it. When Matthew and I took you to bring you up, we resolved we would do the best we could for you and give you a good education. I believe in a girl being fitted to earn her own living, whether she ever has to or not. You'll always have a home at Green Gables as long as Matthew and I are here, but nobody knows what is going to happen in this uncertain world, and it's just as well to be prepared. So, you can join the Queen's class if you like, Anne. Oh, Marilla, thank you. Anne flung her arms about Marilla's waist and looked up earnestly into her face. I'm extremely grateful to you and Matthew, and I'll study as hard as I can and do my very best to be a credit to you. I warn you not to expect much in geometry, but I think I can hold my own in anything else if I work hard. I dare say you'll get along well enough. Miss Stacy says you are bright and diligent. Not for worlds would Marilla have told Anne just what Miss Stacy had said about her. That would have been to t pamper vanity. You needn't rush to any extreme of killing yourself over your books. There is no hurry. You won't be ready to try the entrance for a year and a half yet. But it's well to begin in time and be thoroughly grounded, Miss Stacy says. I shall take more interest than ever in my studies now, said Anne blissfully, because I have a purpose in life. Mr. Allen says everybody should have a purpose in life and pursue it faithfully. Only he says we must first make sure that it is a worthy purpose. I would call it a worthy purpose to want to be a teacher like Miss Stacy, wouldn't you, Marilla? I think it's a very noble profession. The Queen's class was organized in due time. Gilbert Blythe, Anne Shirley, Ruby Gillis, Jane Andrews, Josie Pye, Charlie Sloan, and Moody Spurgeon McPherson joined it. Diana Berry did not, as her parents did not intend to send her to Queens. 
This seemed nothing short of a calamity to Anne. Never since the night on which Minnie May had had the croup had she and Diana been separated in anything. On the evening when the Queen's class first remained in school for the extra lessons and Anne saw Diana go slowly out with the others to walk home alone to the birch path and violet veil, it was all the former could do to keep her seat and refrain from rushing impulsively after her chum. A lump came into her throat and she hastily retired behind the pages of her uplifted Latin grammar to hide the tears in her eyes. Not for worlds would Anne have had Gilbert Blythe or Josie Pye see those tears. But oh, Marilla, I really felt that I had tasted the bitterness of death, as Mr. Allen said in his sermon last Sunday, when I saw Diana go out alone, she said mournfully that night. I thought how splendid it would have been if Diana had only been going to study for the entrance too, but we can't have things perfect in this imperfect world, as Mrs. Lynde says. Mrs. Lynde isn't exactly a comforting person sometimes, but there's no doubt she says a great many very true things. And I think the Queen's class is going to be extremely interesting. Jane and Ruby are just going to study to be teachers. That is the height of their ambition. Ruby says she will only teach for two years after she gets through, and then she intends to be married. Jane says she will devote her whole life to teaching and never, never marry because you are paid a salary for teaching, but a husband won't pay you anything and growls if you ask for a share in the egg and butter money. I expect Jane speaks from mournful experience, for Mrs. Lynn says that her father is a perfect old crank and meaner than second skimmings. Josie Pye says she is going to college for education's sake because she won't have to earn her own living. She says, of course, it is different with orphans who are living on charity. They have to hustle. Moody Spurgeon is going to be a minister. Mrs. Lynn says he couldn't be anything else with a name like that to live up to. I hope it isn't wicked of me, Marilla, but really the thought of Moody Spurgeon being a minister makes me laugh. He's such a funny looking boy with that big fat face and his little blue eyes and his ears sticking out like flaps. But perhaps he will be more intellectual looking when he grows up. Charlie Sloan says he's going to go into politics and be a member of parliament, but Mrs. Lynn says he'll never succeed at that because the Sloans are all honest people and it's only rascals that get in on politics nowadays. <clears throat> what is Gilbert Blythe going to be, queried Marilla, seeing that Anne was opening her, her Caesar. I don't happen to know what Gilbert Blythe's ambition in life is, if he has any, said Anne scornfully. There was an open rivalry between Gilbert and Anne now. Previously, the rivalry had been rather one-sided, but there was no longer any doubt that Gilbert was as determined to be first in class as Anne was. He was a foeman worthy of her steel. The other members of the class tactfully acknowledged their superiority and never dreamed of trying to compete with them. Since the day by the pond when she had refused to listen to his plea for forgiveness, Gilbert, save for the aforesaid determined rivalry, had evinced no recognition whatever of the existence of Anne Shirley. He talked and jested with the other girls, exchanged books and puzzles with them, discussed lessons and plans, sometimes walked home with one or the other of them from prayer meeting or debating club. But Anne Shirley he simply ignored, and Anne found out that it was not pleasant to be ignored. It was in vain that she told herself with a toss of her head that she did not care. Deep down in her wayward, feminine little heart, she knew that she did care, and that if she had the chance at the Lake of Shining Waters again, she would answer very differently. All at once, as it seemed, and to her secret dismay, she found that the old resentment she had cherished against him was gone, gone just when she most needed its sustaining power. It was in vain that she recalled every incident and emotion of that memorable occasion and tried to feel the old satisfying anger. That day by the pond had witnessed its last spasmodic flicker. Anne realized that she had forgiven and forgotten without knowing it, but it was too late. And at least neither Gilbert nor anybody else, not even Diana, should ever suspect how sorry she was and how much she wished she hadn't been so proud and horrid. She determined to shroud her feelings in deepest oblivion, and it may be stated here and now that she did it so successfully that Gilbert, who possibly was not quite so indifferent as he seemed, could not console himself with any belief that Anne felt his retaliatory scorn. The only poor comfort he had was that she snubbed Charlie Sloane unmercifully, continually and undeservedly. 
Otherwise, the winter passed away in a round of pleasant duties and studies. For Anne, the days slipped by like golden beads on the necklace of the year. She was happy, eager, interested. There were lessons to be learned and honors to be won, delightful books to read, new pieces to be practiced for the Sunday school choir, pleasant Saturday afternoons at the manse with Mrs. Allen. And then, almost before Anne realized it, spring had come again to Green Gables and all the world was abloom once more. Studies palled just a wee bit then, the Queen's class, left behind in school while the others scattered to green lanes and leafy woodcuts and meadow byways, looked wistfully out the windows and discovered that Latin verbs and French exercises had somehow lost the tang and zest they had possessed in the crisp winter months. Even Anne and Gilbert lagged and grew indifferent. Teacher and taught were alike glad when the term was ended and the glad vacation days stretched rosily before them. But you've done good work this past year, Miss Stacy told them on the last evening, and you deserve a good jolly vacation. Have the best time you can in the out-of-door world and lay in a good stock of health and vitality and ambition to carry you through next year. It will be the tug of war, you know, the last year before the entrance. Are you going to be back next year, Miss Stacy? asked Josie Pye. Josie Pye never scrupled to ask questions. In this instance, the rest of the class felt grateful to her. None of them would have dared to ask it of Miss Stacy, but all wanted to, for there had been alarming rumors running at large through the school for some time that Miss Stacy was not coming back the next year, that she had been offered a position in the graded school of her own home district and meant to accept. The Queen's class listened in breathless suspense for her answer. Yes, I think I will, said Miss Stacy. I thought of taking another school, but I have decided to come back to Avonlea. To tell the truth, I've grown so interested in my pupils here that I found I couldn't leave them. So I'll stay and see you through. Hurrah, said, said Moody Spurgeon. Moody Spurgeon had never been so carried away by his feelings before, and he blushed uncomfortably every time he thought about it for a week. Oh, I'm so glad, said Anne with shining eyes. Dear Miss Stacy, it would be perfectly dreadful if you didn't come back. I don't believe I could have the heart to go on with my studies at all if another teacher came here. When Anne got home that night, she stacked all her textbooks away in an old trunk in the attic, locked it, and threw the key into the blanket box. I'm not even going to look at a school book in vacation, she told Marilla. I've studied as hard all the term as I possibly could, and I've pored over that geometry until I know every proposition in the first book off by heart, even when the letters are arranged. I just feel tired of everything sensible. I'm going to let my imagination run riot for the summer. Oh, you needn't be alarmed, Marilla. I'll only let it run riot within reasonable limits. But I want to have a real good jolly time this summer, for maybe it's the last summer I'll be a little girl. Mrs. Lynn says that if I keep stretching out next year as I've done this, I'll have to put on longer skirts. She says I'm all running to legs and eyes. And when I put on longer skirts, I shall feel that I have to live up to them and be very dignified. It won't even do to believe in fairies then, I'm afraid, so I'm going to believe in them with all my whole heart this summer. I think we're going to have a very gay vacation. Ruby Gillis is going to have a birthday party soon, and there's the Sunday school picnic and the missionary concert next month. And Mr. Barry says that some evening he'll take Diana and me over to the White Sands Hotel and have dinner there. They have dinner there in the evening, you know. Jane Andrews was over once last summer, and she says it was a dazzling sight to see the electric lights and the flowers and all the lady guests in such beautiful dresses. Jane says it was her first glimpse into high life, and she'll never forget it to her dying day. Mrs. Lynn came up the next afternoon to fi find out why Marilla had not been at the aid meeting on Thursday. When Marilla was not at aid meeting, at at aid meeting, people knew there was something wrong at Green Gables. Matthew had a, had a bad spell with his heart Thursday, Marilla explained, and I didn't feel like leaving him. Oh yes, he's all right again now, but he takes them spells softer than he used to, and I'm anxious about him, oftener than he used to, and I'm anxious about him. The doctor says he must be careful to avoid excitement. That's easy, though, for Matthew doesn't go about looking for excitement by any means and never did but he's not to do any very heavy work either, and you might as well tell Matthew not to breathe as not to work. 
Come and lay off your things, Rachel. You'll stay for tea? Well, seeing you're so pressing, perhaps I might as well stay, said Rachel, who had not the slightest intention of doing anything else. Mrs. Rachel and Marilla sat comfortably in the parlor while Anne got the tea and made hot biscuits that were light and white enough to defy even Mrs. Rachel's criticism. I must say Anne has turned out a real smart girl, admitted Miss Rachel, as Marilla accompanied her to the end of the lane at sunset. She must be a great help to you. She is, said Marilla, and she's real steady and reliable now. I used to be afraid she'd never get over her feather-brained ways, but she has, and I wouldn't be afraid to trust her in anything now. I never would have thought she'd have turned out so well that first day I was here three years ago, said Mrs. Rachel. Lawful heart shall I ever forget the tant that tantrum of hers. When I went home that night, I says to Thomas, says I, Mark my words, Thomas, Marilla Cuthbert will live to rue the step she's took. But I was mistaken, and I'm real glad of it. I ain't one of those kind of people, Marilla, as can never be brought to own up that they've made a mistake. No, that never was my way, thank goodness. I did make a mistake in judging Anne, but it weren't no wonder for an odder, unexpected or witch of a child there never was in this world, that's what. There was no ciphering her out by the rules that worked with other children. It's nothing short of wonderful how she's improved these three years, but especially in looks. She's a real pretty girl, got to be. Though I can't say I'm overly partial to that pale, big-eyed style myself, I like more snap and color like Diana Barry has or Ruby Gillis. Ruby Gillis's looks are, are real showy, but somehow I don't know how it is, but when Anne and them are together, though she ain't half as handsome, she makes them look kind of common and overdone. Something like them white June lilies she calls Narcissus alongside of the big red peonies, that's what. <laughs> All right, on to chapter 31. Where the brook and river meet. Anne had her good summer and enjoyed it wholeheartedly. She and Diana fairly lived outdoors, reveling in all the delights that Lover's Lane and the Dryad's Bubble and Willowmere and Victoria Island afforded. Marilla offered no objections to Anne's gypsies. The Spencer Vale doctor who had come that night, Minnie May, had the croup, met Anne at the house of a patient one afternoon, early in vacation, looked her over sharply, screwed up his mouth, shook his head, and sent a message to Marilla Cuthbert by another person. It was, keep that red-headed girl of yours in the open air all summer and don't let her read books until she gets more spring into her step. This message frightened Marilla wholesomely. She read Anne's death warrant by consumption in, its, in it, unless it was scrupulously obeyed. As a result, Anne had the golden summer of her life as far as freedom and frolic went. She walked, rode, buried, and dreamed to her heart's content, and when September came, she was bright-eyed and alert, with a step that would have satisfied the Spencervale doctor and a heart full of ambition and zest once more. I feel just like studying with might and main, she declared as she brought her books down from the attic. Oh, you good old friends, I'm glad to see your honest faces once more. Yes, even you, geometry. I've had a perfectly beautiful summer, Marilla, and now I'm rejoicing as a strong man to run a race, as Mr. Allen said last Sunday. Doesn't Mr. Allen preach magnificent sermons? Mrs. Lynn says he is improving every day, and the first thing we know, some city church will gobble him up and then will be left and have to turn to and break in another green preacher. But I don't see the use of meeting trouble halfway, do you, Marilla? I think it would be better just to enjoy Mr. Allen while we have him. If I were a man, I think I'd be a minister. They can have such a, an influence for good in their theology, if their theology is sound. And it must be thrilling to preach splendid sermons and stir your hearers' hearts. Why can't women be Mr. ministers, Marilla? I asked Mrs. Lynde that, and she was shocked and said it would be a scandalous thing. She said there might be female ministers in the States, and she believed there was, but thank goodness we hadn't got to that stage in Canada yet, and she hoped we never would. But I don't see why. I think women would make splendid ministers. When there is a social to be got up or a church tea or anything else to raise money, the women have to turn to and do the work. 
I'm sure Mrs. Lynn can pray every bit as well as Superintendent Bell, and I've no doubt she could preach too <laughs> with a little practice. Yes, I believe she could, said Marilla dryly. She does plenty of unofficial preaching as it is. Nobody has much of a chance to go wrong in Avonlea with Rachel to oversee them. Marilla, said Anne in a burst of confidence, I want to tell you something and ask you what you think of it. It has worried me terribly, on Sunday afternoons, that is, when I think specially about such matters. I do really want to be good, and when I'm with you or Mrs. Allen or Miss Stacy, I want it more than ever, and I want to do just what would please you and what you would approve of. But mostly, when I'm with Mrs. Lynde, I feel des desperately wicked, as if I wanted to go and do the very thing she tells me I oughtn't to do. I feel irresistibly tempted to do it. Now, what do you think is the reason I feel like that? Do you think it's because I'm really bad and un unregenerate? Marilla looked dubious for a moment, then she laughed. <laughs> if you are, I guess I am too, Anne, for Rachel often has that very effect on me. I sometimes think she'd have more of an influence for good, as you say yourself, if she didn't keep nagging people to do right. There should have been a special commandment against nagging, but there, I shouldn't talk so. Rachel is a good Christian woman, and she means well. There isn't a kinder soul in Avonlea, and she never shirks her share of work. I'm very glad you feel the same, said Anne decidedly. It's so encouraging. I shan't worry so much over that after this, but I dare say there will be other things to worry me. They keep coming up new all the time, things to perplex you, you know. You settle one question, and there's another right after. There are so many things to be thought over and decided when you're beginning to grow up. It keeps me busy all the time thinking them over and deciding what is right. It's a serious thing to grow up, isn't it, Marilla? But when I have such good friends as you and Matthew and Mrs. Allen and Miss Stacy, I ought to grow up successfully, and I'm sure it will be my own fault if I don't. I feel it's a great responsibility because I only have the chance, the one chance. If I don't grow up right, I can't go back and begin over again. I've grown two inches this summer, Marilla. Mr. Gillis measured me at Ruby's party. I'm so glad you made my new dresses longer. That green, dark green one is so pretty, and it was sweet of you to put on the flounce. Of course, I know it wasn't really necessary, but flounces are so stylish this fall, and Josie Pye has flounces on all her dresses. I know I'll be able to study better because of mine. I shall have such a comfortable feeling deep down in my mind about that flounce. It's worth something to have that, admitted Marilla. Miss Stacy came back to Avonlea School and found all her pupils eager for work once more. Especially did the Queen's class gird up their loins for the fray, for at the end of the coming year, dimly shadowing their pathway already, loomed up that fateful thing known as the entrance, at the thought of which one and all felt their hearts sink into their very shoes. Suppose they did not pass. That thought was doomed to haunt Anne through the waking hours of that winter, Sunday afternoons inclusive, to the most entire exclusion of moral and theological problems. When Anne had bad dreams, she found herself staring miserably at past lists of the entrance exams, where Gilbert Blythe's name was blazoned at the top, and in which hers did not appear at all. But it was a jolly, busy, happy, swift-flying winter. Schoolwork was as interesting, class rivalry as absorbing as of yore. New worlds of thought, feeling, and ambition, fresh, fascinating fields of unexplored knowledge seemed to be opening out before Anne's eager eyes. Hills peeped o'er hill, and alps on alps arose. But of all this was due to Miss Stacy's tactful, careful, broad-minded guidance. She led her class to think and explore and discover for themselves and encouraged strain from the old beaten paths to a degree that quite shocked Mrs. Lynde and the school trustees, who viewed all innovations on established methods rather dubiously. Apart from her studies, Anne expanded socially, for Marilla, mindful of the Spencervale doctor's dictum, no longer vetoed occasional outings. The debating club flourished and gave several concerts. There were one or two parties almost verging on grown-up affairs. They, there were sleigh drives and skating frolics galore. Between times, Anne grew, shooting up so rapidly that Marilla was astonished one day when they were standing side by side to find the girl was taller than herself. Why, Anne, how you've grown, she said almost unbelievingly. 
A sigh followed on the words. Marilla felt a queer regret over Anne's inches. The child had learned to love, she had learned to love, had vanished somehow, and here was this tall, serious-eyed girl of fifteen, with the thoughtful brows and the proudly poised little head in her place. Marilla loved the girl as much as she had loved the child, but she was conscious of a queer, sorrowful sense of loss. And that night, when Anne had gone to prayer meeting with Diana, Marilla sat alone in the wintry twilight and indulged in the weakness of a cry. Matthew, coming in with a lantern, caught her at it and gazed at her in such consternation that Marilla had to laugh through her tears. I was thinking about Anne, she explained. She's got to be such a big girl, and she'll probably be away from us next winter. I'll miss her terrible. She'll be able to come home often, comforted Matthew, to whom Anne was as yet and always would be the little eager girl he had brought home from the bright river on that June evening four years before. The Branch Railroad will be built to Carmody by that time. It won't be the same thing as having her here all the time, sighed Marilla gloomily, determined to enjoy her luxury of grief uncomforted. But there, men can't understand these feelings. There were other changes in Anne no less real than the physical change. For one thing, she became much quieter. Perhaps she thought all the more and dreamed as much as ever, but she certainly talked less. Marilla noticed and commented on this also. You don't chatter half as much as you used to, Anne, nor use half as many big words. What has come over you? Anne colored and laughed a little as she dropped her book and looked dreamily out of the window where big fat red buds were bursting out on the creeper in response to the lure of the spring sunshine. I don't know, I, I don't want to talk as much, she said, denting her chin thoughtfully with her forefinger. It's nicer to think, dear, pretty thoughts and keep them in one's heart like treasures. I don't like to have them laughed at or wondered over. And somehow I don't want to use big words anymore. It's almost a pity, isn't it, now that I'm really growing big enough to say them if I did want to? It's fun to be almost grown up in some ways, but it's not the kind of fun I expected, Marilla. There's so much to learn and do and think that there isn't time for big words. Besides, Miss Stacy says the short ones are much stronger and better. She makes us write all our essays as simply as possible. It was hard at first. I was so used to crowding in all the fine big words I could think of, and I thought of any number of them. But I've got used to it now, and I see it so much better. What has become of your story club? I haven't heard you speak of it for a long time. The story club isn't in existence any longer. We hadn't time for it, and anyhow, I, I think we had got tired of it. It was silly to be writing about love and murder and elopements and mysteries. Miss Stacy sometimes has us write a story for training and composition, but she won't let us write anything but what happened, what might happen in Avonlea in our own lives, and she criticizes it very sharply and makes us criticize our own, too. I never thought my compositions had so many faults until I began to look for them myself. I felt so ashamed I wanted to give up altogether, but Miss Stacy said I could learn to write well if I only trained myself to be my own severest critic, and so I'm trying to. You've only two more months before the entrance, said Marilla. Do you think you'll be able to get through? Anne shivered. I don't know. Sometimes I think I'll be all right, and then I get horribly afraid. We've studied hard, and Miss Stacy has drilled us thoroughly, but we mayn't get through for all that. We've each got a stumbling block. Mine is geometry, of course, and Jane's is Latin, and Ruby's and Charlie's is algebra, and Josie's is arithmetic. Moody Spurgeon says he feels it in his bones that he is going to fail in English history. Miss Stacy is going to give us examinations in June just as hard as we'll have at the entrance and mark us just as strictly, so we'll have some idea. I wish it was all over, Marilla. It haunts me. Sometimes I wake up in the night and wonder what I'll do if I don't pass. Why, go to school next year and try again, said Marilla unconcernedly. Oh, I don't believe I'd have the heart for it. It would be such a disgrace to fail, especially if guilt, if the others passed. And I get so nervous in an examination that I'm likely to make a mess of it. I wish I had nerves like Jane Andrews. Nothing rattles her. Anne sighed, and dragging her eyes from the witcheries of the spring world, the beckoning day of breeze and blue, and the green things upspringing in the garden, buried herself resolutely in her book. 
There would be other springs, but if she did not succeed in passing the entrance and felt convinced that she would never recover sufficiently to enjoy them. All right, chapter 32. The pass list is out. Woo! <laughs> With the end of June came the close of the term and the close of Miss Stacy's rule in Avonlea School. Anne and Diana walked home that evening feeling very sober indeed. Red eyes and damp handkerchiefs bore convincing testimony to the fact that Miss Stacy's farewell words must have been quite as touching as Mr. Phillips had been under similar circumstances three years before. Diana looked back at the schoolhouse from the foot of the spruce hill and sighed deeply. It does seem as if it was the end of everything, doesn't it? She said dismally. You oughtn't to feel half as badly as I do, said Anne, hunting vainly for a dry spot on her handkerchief. You'll be back again next winter, but I suppose I've left the dear old school forever, if I have good luck, that is. It won't be a bit the same. Miss Stacy won't be there, nor you, nor Jane, nor Ruby, probably. I shall have to sit all alone, for I couldn't bear to have another desk made after you. Oh, we have had jolly times, haven't we, Anne? It's dreadful to think they're all over. Two big tears rolled down Diana's nose. If you would stop crying as I could, said Anne imploringly, just as soon as I put away my hanky, I see you brimming up and that starts me off again. As Mrs. Lynn says, if you can't be cheerful, be as cheerful as you can. After all, I dare say I'll be back next year. <laughs> this is one of the times I know I'm not going to pass. They're getting alarmingly frequent. Why, you came out splendidly in the exams Miss Stacy gave. Yes, but those exams don't make me nervous. When I think of the real thing, you can't imagine what a horrid, cold, fluttery feeling comes around my heart. And then my number is 13, and Josie Pye says it's so unlucky. I am not superstitious, and I know it can make no difference, but still, I wish it wasn't 13. I do wish I were going in with you, said Diana. Wouldn't we have a perfectly elegant time? But I suppose you'll have to cram in the evenings. No, Miss Stacy has made a promise not to open a book at all. She says it would only tire and confuse us, and we are going to go out walking and not think about exams at all and go to bed early. It's good advice, but I expect it will be hard to follow. Good advice is apt to be, I think. Prissy Andrews told me that she sat up half the night every night of her entrance week and crammed for dear life, and I had determined to sit up at least as long as she did. It was so kind of your Aunt Josephine to ask me to stay at Beechwood while I'm in town. You'll write to me while you're in, won't you? I'll write Tuesday night and tell you how the first day goes, promised Anne. I'll be haunting the post office Wednesday, vowed Diana. Anne went to town the following Monday, and on Wednesday, Diana haunted the post office, as agreed, and got her letter. Dearest Diana, wrote Anne, here it is, Tuesday night, and I'm writing this in the library at Beechwood. Last night I was horribly lonesome, all alone in my room, and wished so much you were with me. I couldn't cram, because I'd promised Miss Stacy not to, but it was as hard to keep from opening my history as it used to be from, keeping, from reading a story before my lessons were learned. This, story, this morning, Miss Stacy came for me, and we went to the academy, calling for Jane and Ruby and Josie on our way. Ruby asked me to feel her hands, and they were as cold as ice. Josie said I looked as if I hadn't slept a wink, and she didn't believe I was strong enough to stand the grind of the teacher's course, even if I did get through. There are times and seasons, even yet, when I don't feel that I've made any great headway in learning to like Josie Pye. When we reached the academy, there were scores of students there from all over the island. The first person we saw was Moody Spurgeon, sitting on the steps and muttering away to himself. Jane asked him what on earth he was doing, and he said he was repeating the multiplication table over and over to steady his nerves, and for pity's sake not to interrupt him, because if he stopped for a moment he got frightened and forgot everything he knew. But the multiplication table kept all his facts firmly in their proper place. When we were assigned to our rooms, Miss Stacy had to leave us. Jane and I sat together, and Jane was so composed that I envied her. No need of the multiplication table for good, steady, sensible Jane. I wondered if I looked as I felt and if they could hear my heart thumping clear across the room. Then a man came in and began distributing the English examination sheets. My hands grew cold then, and my head fairly whirled around as I picked it up. 
Just one awful moment. Diana, I felt exactly as I did four years ago when I asked Marilla if I might stay at Green Gables. And then everything cleared up in my mind and my heart began beating again. I forgot to say that it had stopped altogether. Where I knew I could do something with that paper anyhow. At noon, we went home for dinner and then back again for history in the afternoon. The history was a pretty hard paper and I got dreadfully mixed up in the dates. Still, I think I did fairly well today. But oh, Diana, tomorrow the geometry exam comes off and when I think of it, it takes every bit of determination I possess to keep from opening my Euclid. If I thought the multiplication table would help me any, I would recite it from now till tomorrow morning. I went down to see the other girls this evening. On my way, I met Moody Spurgeon, wandering distractedly around. He said he knew he had failed in history, and he was born to be a disappointment to his parents, and he was going home on the morning train, and it would be easier to be a carpenter than a minister anyhow. I cheered him up and persuaded him to stay to the end, because it would be unfair to Miss Stacy if he didn't. Sometimes I have wished I was born a boy, but when I see Moody Spurgeon, I'm always glad I'm a girl and not his sister. Ruby was in hysterics when I reached her their boarding house. She had just discovered a fearful mistake she made in her English paper. When she recovered, we went uptown and had an ice cream. How we wished you had been with us. Oh, Diana, if only the geometry examination were over. But there, as Mrs. Lynn would say, the sun will go on rising and setting whether I fail in geometry or not. That is true, but not especially comforting. I think I'd rather it didn't go on if I failed. Yours devotedly, Anne. The geometry examination and all the others were over in due time, and Anne arrived home on Friday evening, rather tired, but with an air of chastened triumph about her. Diana was over at Green Gables when she arrived, and they met as if they had been parted for years. You old darling, it's perfectly splendid to see you back again. It seems like an age since you went to town, and oh, Anne, how did you get along? Perfectly well, I think, in everything but geometry. I don't know whether I passed in it or not, and I have a creepy, crawling presentiment that I, presentiment that I didn't. Oh, how good it is to be back. Green Gables is the dearest, loveliest spot in the world. How did the others do? The girls say they don't know they didn't pass, but I think they did pretty well. Josie says the geometry was so easy a child of ten could do it. Moody Spurgeon still thinks he failed in history, and Charlie says he failed in algebra. But we don't really know anything about it and won't until the pass list is out. That won't be for a fortnight. Fancy living a fortnight in such suspense. I wish I could go to sleep and never wake up until it is over. And Diana knew it would be useless to ask how Gilbert Blythe had fared, so she merely said, Oh, you'll pass all right. Don't worry. I'd rather not pass at all than come out pretty well upon the list, flashed Anne, by which she meant, and Diana knew she meant, that success would be incomplete and bitter if she did not come out ahead of Gilbert Blythe. With this end in view, Anne had strained every nerve during the examinations. So had Gilbert. They had met and passed each other on the street a dozen times without any sign of recognition, and every time Anne had had held her head a little higher and wished a little more earnestly that she had made friends with Gilbert when he asked her and vowed a little more determinedly to surpass him in the examination. She knew that all Avonlea Jr. was wondering which would come out first. She even knew that Jimmy Glover and Ned Wright had a bet on the question and that Josie Pye had said there was no doubt in the world that Gilbert would be first. And she felt that her humiliation would be unbearable if she fell, failed. But she had another and nobler motive for wishing to do well. She wanted to pass high for the sake of Matthew and Marilla, especially Matthew. Matthew had declared to her his conviction that she would beat the whole island that Anne felt was something it would be foolish to hope for even in the wildest dreams. But she did hope fervently that she would be among the first ten at least so that she might see Matthew's kindly brown eyes gleam with pride in her achievement. That, she felt, would be a sweet reward indeed for all her hard work and patient grubbing among unimaginative equations and conjun con conjugations. At the end of the fortnight, Anne took to haunting the post office also in the distracted company of Jane, Ruby, and Josie, opening the Charlottetown dailies with shaking hands and cold sink-away feelings as bad as any experience during the entrance week. 
Charlie and Gilbert were not above doing this too, but Moody Spurgeon stayed resolutely away. I haven't got the grit to go and look at the paper in cold blood, he told Anne. I'm just going to wait until somebody comes and tells me suddenly whether I've passed or not. When three weeks had gone by without the past list appearing, Anne began to feel that she really couldn't stand the strain much longer. Her appetite failed and her interest in Avonlea doings languished. Mrs. Lynn wanted to know what else you could expect with a Tory superintendent of education at the head of affairs, and Matthew, noting Anne's paleness and indifference and the lagging steps that bore her home from the post office every afternoon, began seriously to wonder if he hadn't better vote grit at the next election. But one evening the news came. Anne was sitting at her open window for the time forgetful of the woes of examinations and the cares of the world as she drank in the beauty of the summer dusk, sweet scented with flower breaths from the garden below and sibilant and rustling from the stir of poplars. The eastern sky above the firs was flushed faintly pink from the reflection of the west and Anne was wondering dreamily if the spirit of color looked like that when she saw Diana coming flying down through the firs over the log bridge and up the slope with a fluttering newspaper in her hand. Anne sprang to her feet, knowing at once what that paper contained. The pass list was out. Her head whirled and her heart beat until it hurt her. She could not move a step. It seemed an hour to her before Diana came rushing along the hall and burst into the room without even knocking, so great was her excitement. Anne, you've passed, she cried, passed the very first, you and Gilbert both, your ties, but your name is first. Oh, I'm so proud. Diana flung the paper on the table and herself on Anne's bed, utterly breathless and incapable of further speech. Anne lighted the lamp, oversetting the match safe and using up half a dozen matches before her shaking hands could accomplish the task. Then she snatched up the paper. Yes, she had passed. There was her name at the very top of the list of 200. That moment was worth living for. You did just splendidly, Anne, puffed Diana, recovering sufficiently to sit up and speak, for Anne, starry-eyed and rapt, had not uttered a word. Father brought the paper home from Bright River not ten minutes ago. It came out on the afternoon train, you know, and won't be here till tomorrow by mail. And when I saw the pass list, I just rushed over like a wild thing. You've all passed, every one of you, Moody Spurgeon and all, although he's conditioned in history. Jane and Ruby did pretty well. They're halfway up, and so did Charlie. Josie just scraped through with three marks to spare, but you'll see she'll put on as many airs as if she led. Won't Miss Stacy be delighted? Oh, Anne, what does it feel like to see your name at the head of a pass list like that? If it were me, I know I'd go crazy with joy. I am nearly pretty near crazy as it is, but you're as calm and cool as spring evening. I'm just dazzled inside, said Anne. I want to say a hundred things and I can't find words to say them in. I never dreamed of this. Yes, I did too, just once. I let myself think once. What if I should come out first? Quakingly, you know, for it seems so vain and presumptuous to think I could lead the island. Excuse me a minute, Diana. I must run right out to the field to tell Matthew. Then we'll go up the road and tell the good news to others. They hurried to the hayfield below the barn where Matthew was co coiling hay, and as luck would have it, Mrs. Lynn was talking to Marilla at the lane fence. Oh, Matthew, exclaimed Anne, I've passed and I'm first, or, or one of the first, I'm not vain, but I'm thankful. Well now, I always said it, said Matthew, gazing at the pass list delightedly. I knew you could beat them all easy. You've done pr pretty well, I must say, Anne, said Marilla, trying to hide her extreme pride in Anne from Mrs. Rachel's critical eye. But that good soul said heartedly, I just guess she has done well, and far be it from me to go backward in saying it. You're a credit to your friends, Anne, that's what, and we're all proud of you. That night, Anne, who had wound up a delightful evening by a serious little talk with Mrs. Allen at the manse, knelt sweetly by her open window in a great sheen of moonshine and murmured a prayer of gratitude and aspiration that came straight from her heart. There was in it thankfulness for the past and reverent petition for the future, and when she slept on her white pillow, her dreams were as fair and bright and beautiful as maidenhood might desire. Aww. 
All right, let's continue on to our last chapter for the day. This is chapter 33, The Hotel Concert. Put on your white organdy by all means, Anne, advised Diana decidedly. They were together in the east gable chamber. Outside it was only twilight, a lovely yellowish-green twilight with a clear blue cloudless sky, a big round moon slowly deepening from her pallid luster into burnished silver hung over the haunted wood. The air was full of sweet summer sounds, sleepy birds twittering, freakish breezes, faraway voices and laughter. But in Anne's room, the blind was drawn and the lamp lighted for an important toilet was being made. The East Gable was a very different place from what it had been on that night four years before, when Anne had felt its bareness penetrate to the mar marrow of her spirit with its inhospitable chill. Changes had crept in, Marilla con conniving at them resignedly, until it was as sweet and dainty as a, a nest as a young girl could desire. The velvet carpet with the pink roses and the pink silk curtains of Anne's early visions had certainly never materialized, but her dreams had kept pace with her growth, and it is not probable she lamented them. The floor was covered with a pretty matting, and the curtains had softened the high window and fluttered in the vagrant breezes were of pale green art muslin. The walls hung not with gold and silver brocade tap tapestry, but with a dainty apple blossom paper, were adorned with a few good pictures given Anne by Mrs. Allen. Miss Stacy's photograph occupied the place of honor, and Anne made a sentimental point of keeping fresh flowers on the bracket under it. Tonight, a spike of white lilies fainted, faintly perfumed the room like the dream of a fragrance. There was no mahogany furniture, but there was a white-painted bookcase filled with books, a cushioned wicker rocker, a toilet table befrilled with white muslin, a quaint gilt-framed mirror with chubby pink cupids and purple grapes painted over its arched top that used to hang in the spare room and a low white bed. Anne was dressing for a concert at the White Sands Hotel. The guests had got it up in aid of the Charlottetown Hospital and had hunted all over the available amateur talent in the surrounding districts to help it along. Bertha Sampson and Pearl Clay of the White Sands Baptist Choir had been asked to sing a duet. Milton Clark of Newbridge was to give a violin solo. Winnie Adela Blair of Carmody was to sing a Scotch ballad. And Laura Spencer of Spencer Vale and Anne Shirley of Avonlea were to recite. As Anne would have said at one time, it was an epoch in her life, and she was deliciously athrill with the excitement of it. Matthew was in the seventh heaven of gratitude pride over the honor conferred on his Anne, and Marilla was not far behind, although she would have died rather than admit it, and said she didn't think it was very proper for a lot of young folks to be gadding over to the hotel without any responsible person with them. Anne and Diana were to drive over with Jane Andrews and her brother Billy in their double-seated buggy, and several other Avonlea girls and boys were going too. There was a party of visitors expected out from town, and after the concert, a supper was to be given to the performers. Do you really think the organdy will be best? queried Anne anxiously. I don't think it's as pretty as my blue-flowered muslin, and it certainly isn't so fashionable. But it suits you ever so much better, said Diana. It's soft and frilly and clinging. The muslin is stiff and makes you look too dressed up, but the organdy seems as if it grew on you. Anne sighed and yielded. Diana was beginning to have a reputation for notable taste in dressing, and her advice on such, such subjects was much sought after. She was looking very pretty herself on this particular night in a dress of the lovely wild rose pink, from which Anne was forever debarred. But... She was not to take any part in the concert, so her appearance, her appearance was of minor importance. All her pains were bestowed upon Anne, who, she vowed, must, for the credit of Avonlea, be dressed and combed and adorned to the Queen's taste. Pull out that frill a little more, so here, let me tie your sash. Now for your slippers. I'm going to braid your hair in two thick braids and tie them halfway up with a big white bows. Uh, no, don't pull out a single curl over your forehead. Just have the soft part. There is no way you do your hair. There is no way you do your hair suits you so well, Anne. And Mrs. Allen says you look like a Madonna when you part it so. I shall fasten this little white house rose just behind your ear. There, 
was just one on my bush and I saved it for you. Shall I put my pearl beads on? asked Anne. Matthew bought me a string from town last week and I know he'd like to see them on me. Diana pursed up her lips and put her black head on one side critically and finally pronounced in favor of the beads, which were thereupon tied around Anne's slim milk-white throat. There's something so stylish about you, Anne, said Diana with unenvious admir admiration. You hold your head with such an air. I suppose it's your figure. <laughs> I am just a dumpling. I've always been afraid of it, and now I know it is so. Well, I suppose I shall just have to resign myself to it. But you have such dimples, said Anne, smiling affectionately to the pretty, vivacious face so near her own. Lovely dimples, like little dents in cream. I have given up all hope of dimples. My dimple dream will never come true, but so many of my dreams have that have that I mustn't complain. Am I all ready now? All ready, assured Diana, as Marilla appeared in the doorway, a gaunt figure with grayer hair, hair than of yore, and no fewer angles, but with a much softer face. Come right in and look at our el elocutionist, Marilla. Doesn't she look lovely? Marilla emitted a sound between a sniff and a grunt. She looks neat and proper. I like the way of fixing her hair, but I expect she'll ruin that dress driving over there in the dust and dew with it, and it looks most too thin for these damp nights. Organdy's the most unserviceable stuff in the world, anyhow. I told Matthew so when he got it. But there is no use in saying anything to Matthew nowadays. Time was when he would take my advice, but now he just buys things for Anne's regardless for Anne regardless, and the clerks at Carmody know they can palm anything off on him. Just let them tell him a thing is pretty and fashionable, and Matthew plunks his money down for it. Mind you keep your skirt clear of the wheel, Anne, and put your warm jacket on. Then Marilla stalked downstairs, thinking proudly how sweet Anne looked with that one moonbeam from the forehead to the crown, and regretting that she could not go to the concert herself to hear her girl recite. I wonder if it is too damp for my dress, said Anne anxiously. Not a bit of it, said Diana, pulling up the window blind. It's a perfect night and there won't be any dew. Look at the moonlight. I'm so glad my window looks east into the sun rising, said Anne, going over to Diana. It's so splendid to see the morning coming up over those long hills and glowing through those sharp fir tops. It's new every morning and I feel as if I washed my very soul in the bath of earliest sunshine. Oh, Diana, I love this little room so dearly. I don't know how I'll get along without it when I go to town next month. Don't speak of your going away tonight, begged Diana. I don't want to think of it. It makes me so miserable, and I do want to have a good time this evening. What are you going to recite, Anne? Are you nervous? Not a bit. I've recited so often in public, I don't mind at all now. I've decided to give the maiden's vow. It's so pathetic. Laura Spencer is going to give a comic recitation, but I'd rather make people cry than laugh. What will you recite if they encore you? Oh, they won't dream of encoring me, scoffed Anne, who was not without her own secret hopes that they would, and also already envisioned herself telling Matthew all about it at the next morning's breakfast table. There are Billy and Jane now. I hear the wheels. Uh, come on. Let's see how f much more we have. Okay, we'll finish up this chapter. Let's see. Billy Andrews insisted that Anne should ride on the front seat with him, so she unwillingly climbed up. She would have preferred to sit back with the girls, where she could have laughed and chattered to her heart's content. There was not much of either laughter or chatter in Billy. He was a big, fat, stolid youth of twenty with a round, expressionless face and a painful lack of conversational gifts. But he admired Anne immensely and was puffed up with pride over the prospect of driving to White Sands with that slim, upright figure beside him. And by dint of talking over her shoulder to the girls and occasionally passing a sop of civility to Billy, who grinned and chuckled and never could think of any reply until it was too late, contrived to enjoy the drive in spite of it all. It was a night for enjoyment. The road was full of buggies, all bound for the hotel, and laughter, silver clear, echoed and re-echoed along it. When they reached the hotel, it was a blaze of light from top to bottom. They were met by the ladies of the concert committee, one of whom took Anne off to the performer's dressing room, which was filled with the members of a Charlottetown symphony club, among whom Anne felt suddenly shy and frightened and, and countrified. 
Her dress, which in the East Gable had seemed so dainty and pretty, now seemed simple and plain. Too simple and plain, she thought, among all the silks and laces that glistened and rustled around her. What were her pearl beads compared to the diamonds of the big handsome lady near her? And how poor her one wee white rose must look beside all the hot house flowers the others wore. Anne laid her hat and jacket away and shrank miserably into a corner. She wished herself back in the white room of Green Gables. It was still worse on the platform of the big concert hall of the hotel, where she presented where she presently found herself. The electric lights dazzled her eyes. The perfume and hum bewildered her. She wished she were sitting down in the audience with Diana and Jane, who seemed to be having a splendid time away at the back. She was wedged in between a stout lady in pink silk and a tall, scornful-looking girl in a white lace dress. The stout lady occasionally turned her head squarely around and surveyed Anne through her eyeglasses until Anne, acutely sensitive of being so scrutinized, felt that she must scream aloud. And the white la lace girl kept talking audibly to her next neighbor about the country bumpkins and rustic bells in the audience, languidly anticipating such fun from the displays of local talent on the program. Anne believed that she would hate that white lace girl to the end of her life. Unfortunately for Anne, a professional elocutionist was staying at the hotel and had consented to recite. She was a lithe, dark-eyed woman in a wonderful gown of shimmering gray stuff like woven moonbeams, with gems on her neck and in her dark hair. She had a marvelously flexible voice and a wonderful power of expression. The audience went wild over her selection. And, forgetting all about herself and her troubles for the time, listened with rapt and shining eyes. But when the recitation ended, she suddenly put her hands over her face. She could never get up and recite after that, never. Had she ever thought she could recite? Oh, if she were only back at Green Gables. At this unproprituous unpropitious <laughs> moment her name was called. Somehow Anne, who did not notice the rather guilty little start of surprise the white lace girl gave, and would not have understood the subtle compliment implied therein if she had, got on her feet and moved dizzily out to the front. She was so pale that Diana and Jane down in the audience clasped each other's hands in nervous sympathy. Anne was the victim of an overwhelming attack of stage fright. Often as she had as she had recited in Republic, she had never before faced such an audience as this, and the sight of it paralyzed her energies completely. Everything was so strange, so brilliant, so bewildering. The rows of ladies in the evening dress, the critical faces, the whole atmosphere of wealth and culture around her. Very different this from, very different this from the plain benches of the debating club, filled with the homely, sympathetic faces of friends and neighbors. These people, she thought, would be merciless critics. Perhaps, like the white lace girl, they anticipated amusement from her rustic efforts. She felt hopelessly, helplessly ashamed and miserable. Her knees trembled, her heart fluttered. A horrid faintness came over her. Not a word could be uttered. And the next moment, she would have fled from the platform despite the humil humiliation, which she felt must ever after be her portion if she did so. But suddenly, as her dilated, frightened eyes gazed out over the audience, she saw Gilbert Blythe away at the back of the room, bending forward with a smile on his face, a smile which seemed to end at once triumphant and taunting. In reality, it was nothing of the kind. Gilbert was merely smiling with appreciation of the whole affair in general and of the effect produced by Anne's slender white form and spiritual face against the background of palms in particular. Josie Pye, whom he had driven over, sat beside him, and her face certainly was both triumphant and taunting. But Anne did not see Josie and would not have cared if she had. She drew a long breath and flung her head up proudly, courage and determination tinging, tingling over her like an electric shock. She would not fail before Gilbert Blythe. He should never be able to laugh at her, never, never. Her fright and nervousness vanished, and she began her recitation, her clear, sweet voice reaching to the farthest corner of the room without a tremor or a break. 
self-possession was fully restored to her, and in the reaction from that horrible moment of powerlessness, she recited as if she had never done before. When she finished, there were bursts of honest applause, and stepping back to her seat, blushing with shyness and delight, found her hand vigorously clasped and shaken by the stout lady in pink silk. "'My dear, you did splendidly,' she puffed. "'I've been crying like a baby. Actually, I have. "'There, they're encoring you. They're bound to have you back.' "'Oh, I can't go,' said Anne confusedly. "'But yet I must, or our Matthew will be disappointed. "'He said they would encore me.' "'Then don't disappoint Matthew,' said pink, the pink lady, laughing. "'Smiling, blushing, <laughs> limpid-eyed, Anne tripped back and gave a quaint, funny little selection that captivated her audience still further. The rest of the evening was quite a little triumph for her. When the concert was over, the stout pink lady, who was the wife of an American millionaire, took her under her wing and introduced her to everybody, and everybody was very nice to her. The professional elocutionist Mrs. Evans came and chatted with her, telling her that she had a charming voice and interpreted, interpreted her selections beautifully. Even the white lace girl paid her a languid little compliment. They had supper in the big, beautifully decorated dining room. Diana and Jane were invited to partake of this also, since they had come with Diane, er, with Anne. But Billy was nowhere to be found, having decamped in mortal fear of some such invitation. He was in waiting for them, with the team, however, when it was all over, and the three girls came merrily out into the calm, white moonshine radiance and breathed deeply, and looked into the clear sky beyond the dark boughs of the firs. Oh, it was good to be out again in the purity and silence of the night. How great and still and wonderful everything was, with the murmur of the sea sounding through it, and the darkling cliffs beyond like grim giants guarding enchanted coasts. Hasn't it been a perfectly splendid time, sighed Jane as they drove away. I just wish I was a rich American and could spend my summer at a hotel and wear jewels and low-neck dresses and have ice cream and chicken salad every blessed day. I'm sure it would be ever so much more fun than teaching school. And your recitation was simply great, although I thought at first you were never going to begin. I thought it was better than Mrs. Evans. Oh, no, don't say things like that, Jane, said Anne quickly, because it sounds silly. It couldn't be better than Mrs. Evans, you know, for she is a professional, and I'm only a schoolgirl with a little knack of reciting. I've quite, I'm quite satisfied if the people just liked mine pretty well. I have a compliment for, I have a compliment for you, Anne, said Diana. At least I think it must be a compliment, because the tone he said in, it in, Part of it was, anyhow. There was an American sitting behind Jane and me, such a romantic-looking man with coal-black hair and eyes. Josie Pye says he is a distinguished artist and that her mother's cousin in Boston is married to a man that used to go to school with him. Well, I heard him say, didn't we, Jane? Who is that girl on the platform with the splendid titanium hair? She has a face I should like to paint. There now, Anne. What does titanium hair mean? Being interpreted, it means plain red, I guess, <laughs> laughed Anne. Titanian was a very famous artist who liked to paint red-haired women. Did you see all the diamonds those ladies wore, sighed Jane. They were simply dazzling. Wouldn't you just love to be rich girls? We are rich, said Anne sta staunchly. Why, we have 16 years to our credit, and we're happy as queens, and we've all got imaginations, more or less. Look at the sea, girls, all silver and shadow and vision of things not seen. We couldn't enjoy its loveliness any more if we had millions of dollars and ropes of diamonds. You wouldn't change into any of those women's if you could. Would you want to be that white-laced girl and wear a sour look all your life, as if you'd been born turning up your nose at the world? Or the pink lady, kind and nice as she is, so stout and short that you'd really no figure at all? Or even Mrs. Evans with that sad, sad look in her eyes. She must have been dreadfully unhappy sometime to have such a look. You know you wouldn't, Jane Andrews. I don't know exactly, said Jane, unconvinced. I think diamonds would comfort a person a good deal. Well, I don't want to be any part of it but myself, even if I go uncomforted by diamonds all my life, declared Anne. I'm quite content to be Anne of Green Gables with my string of pearl beads. I know Matthew gave me as much love with them as ever went with Madame the Pink Lady's jewels. 
Aw, a very sweet end to a, a lovely chapter. And I was genuinely very excited to see Anne uh, not only uh, succeed in her entrance exams, but make it to the very top. So. Uh, we are a bit past our time today, so um, I'll conclude quickly by saying uh, thank you, first of all, for, for joining me today and for these past live streams. We've really enjoyed them. And if you would like to support us, you can always uh, donate online at our website, www.negahc.org. Um, but other ways you can support, of course, are to tell your friends and family about us, recommend us on um, on on your social media, share our content, and of course, join us for uh, more of our live streams. Today, we have a very uh, exciting program at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, historian Glenn Kyle is going to be exploring uh, the American frontier. So do join us for that. And as it is Thursday today, I will see you tomorrow to continue on to chapter uh, 34. And we are reaching the end. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get to the very end tomorrow, but once we do reach the end, we are going to have a live stream program about the historical context of um, this book, a little more about Ellen Montgomery's life. So we'll be planning that as well. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for joining us. And I do hope you will stay uh, happy and healthy. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.